me pray. Jesus, I pray this morning, here in this place, for anyone who's listening or watching, if life is threatening to fall apart on them right now, God, I pray that they would know that it is okay if it's okay with their soul. God, I pray right now that, Lord, that You will help us to reconnect again with who You are on the inside of who we are. The Lord, when everything on the inside, everything on the outside feels like it's kind of, you know, going all over the place. God, there is an anchor. There is a refuge. There is a foundation. There is a sense of rightness and connectedness when it is well with our soul. So Jesus, I pray now that as we look at what it is to have a healthy soul, God, will You speak to us? Will You, will you sharpen us? Will you, will you adjust things, God, so that we can walk out of this place saying, hey, life might be tough, but it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats, guys. Guys, thank you so much. We're going to come back and sing again uh, in a moment or two's time, okay? But I want to I want to just uh, continue this series. Thank you so much for those of you that have uh, given me really positive feedback about this. Those of you that have uh, bought the books as well, there's two books that we're promoting, if you like, and we're drawing on material from this book, Soul Keeping by John Ortberg and Soul Detox by Craig Grishel. Um, they're, they're there. You can have a little look at them afterwards if you want to write down numbers. You can get them on Kindle. You can get them uh, on Am all good bookshops and all that kind of stuff as well. So we really encourage you to do that. Um, sooner or later, your world will fall apart. And what matters most is the soul that you have constructed. And last week we looked at Be Still My Restless Soul. How many of you have been less horrid this last week? <laughs> you know, everyone that said to me, how are you doing? I've had to say, I'm busy, but I'm not horrid. Do you know what I mean? Because I was preaching on it last week. I'm busy, but I'm not horrid. And, uh, but this week we're going to look at, um, if, yeah, we're going to look at this, this other theme called Behold My Disconnected Soul. Behold My Disconnected Soul. And I want to look at a, a verse in the Bible. Um, the Bible is not, you know, when we say the Bible, we don't really mean the Bible. We mean that collection of books that we know as the Bible. Okay, we, we give the impression it's one book. It's not one book. It's 66 books written by lots of different people over lots of different years and in lots of different styles and formats. One of the guys that wrote some letters in the second half of what we call the Bible, the New Testament, a guy called John, he writes at the start of a letter, a greeting, and there's some really interesting words in this, and he says this, from the elder to my dearly loved brother Gaius, whom I truly love, beloved friend, I pray that you are prospering in every way, and that you continually enjoy good health, just as your soul is prospering. That's really interesting. So basically what he's saying is, I really hope that you're doing well. I hope life's going well. I hope you're feeling well as your soul is doing well. There's a connection between how your soul is doing and how the rest of you is doing. So this is like a greeting and we do this. And so if you're British, you know what the answer to this. When I say to you, how are you? Your answer is, I'm fine. Of course it is. But you see, do we ever say, okay, well, I'm asking, how are you? I hope that you're prospering, but how's your soul? Or do we ever say, that, hey, John, how you doing? How's work? How's your health? How's your soul? Whoa, that would be a bit weird, wouldn't it? Because it feels like we've gone to a different dimension. But that's what he's saying. He says, listen, as it goes with your soul, so it goes with the rest of you. I pray that you're doing well as your soul is prospering. It's really important that, that if we want to have healthy lives, we have healthy souls. And... For every single one of us, there will come a moment, if it hasn't already come, and it probably has for many of you, where your world will feel like it's falling apart. And what matters the most then is the soul that you have constructed with God's help. So what is your soul? In this book, Soul Keeping, John Ortberg draws on uh, material from his mentor, uh, a guy called Dallas Willard, who again uh, has passed away now, he's in heaven. And and, and he talks in the, in the book about the way Dallas Willard describes the soul. And I'm going to draw on some of that material. And, and Willard says this, any time you want to care for something, you have to understand it, whether it's a beagle or a BMW. You have to understand it, whether you've just had a dog in the house 
And uh, we have a dot, not in our house, but in my son and his wife's house. They just had a brand new puppy. And uh, we were round at my mom's yesterday and the brand new puppy christened the brand new carpet. And there you go. And you have to understand it. Oh, I thought it was hysterical myself. Uh, but, and uh, that's why I haven't got a dog. And, uh, and you have to understand it, whether it's a dog or whether it's a, a car, you have to understand it. And he says this, if your soul is healthy, no external circumstance can destroy your life. But if your soul is unhealthy, no external circumstance can redeem your life. Really, really important quote. So how do we understand the soul? And in our life group this week, me and Alison started a brand new life group. We are loving it, love the people in it, love the connection in it. And we had a really deep conversation on Tuesday night about the soul and the spirit and the conscience. And it's really difficult to understand. There's lots of different theories around. I'm not going to try and box it up too much for you. I want, I want you to have conversation and exploration yourself. But we'll look at a little thing that's in that book here. And it's this kind of diagram here. Uh, the will, the mind, the body, and the soul, just to try and show it in concentric circles. But don't, it's not as simple as this, okay? And it's not as kind of, you know, boxed up or circled up as that. So don't think, oh, now, where is my will here? It's not kind of like that. It's just to kind of explain. But what he talks about in the book is that the will is your capacity to choose. And just trying to change your will through willpower alone is exhausting. Your mind, in the ancient world, mind was not just the way you think, that's very Greek, but in the ancient world, it was a combination of your mind, the way you think, and your emotions. It's also where your conscience and your values is thought to be seated in that whole area of the mind. Your body is that little kingdom that you have control and dominion over. Your soul, if you like, is like the integrating system that wraps around all of that and makes you who you are. This is a quote. The soul is the capacity to integrate all the parts into a single whole life. It is something like a program that runs a computer. You don't usually notice it until it messes up. Isn't that true about technology? I mean, you love technology while it's working. And when it's not working, it's demonic. Do you know what I mean? It's like, what is this horrible thing? Because you don't notice it until it starts messing up. That's what the soul is like. Your soul is what integrates your will, your intentions, your mind, your thoughts, your feelings, your values, your conscience, and your body, your face, your body language, your actions into a single life. Now, in terms of the spirit, my perception on this, and we'll probably talk about this a little bit more later on um, in in future weeks, your spirit is that God bit of you that that activates when you give your life to God and, and you become, the Bible calls it, regenerated, and that kind of spirit of God in you comes alive and connects with God's spirit. And so the soul and the spirit are very much who you are on the inside. But we all have a soul, whether we're a Christian or not. And your soul will live on forever somewhere, whether you're a Christian or not. Okay? So we'll leave that bit there. God's design is that we are integrated and connected as human beings. Our soul is healthy and well-ordered when there is harmony between all these different components of our life. Last week we looked at the enemy of the soul. One of the enemies of the soul was hurry sickness. That's what we looked at last week. This week we're going to look at another enemy which is disconnection. What does it mean to be disconnected in your soul? And I want to talk about it in three arenas really. The first one is disconnection within yourself. And again, I hope this isn't too kind of abstract for you, but we're we're holistic people, aren't we? And um, uh, three years ago at the start of the year I I ran a series um, called Healthy You. And I, and, I, and I looked at the different components. We are physical, we are mental, we are emotional, we're relational, we're spiritual, and we're holistic people. What does it mean to be healthy in all of those different components? And as I was preparing for it, I, God spoke to me when I got to the physical one and said, really? You're really going to talk to the church about being physically healthy? Look at you. And I did look at myself in the mirror, and I was two and a half stone heavier than I am now and hadn't been to a gym or done any exercise in a very, very long time. And and as a result of that, I put some things into my life. And I'm not going to talk to you about losing weight. Really annoying when people who've lost weight stand up and talk to you about losing weight. I'm not going to do that. But what happened to me was I looked at those different components of my life and I realized they weren't connected. I wasn't integrating them all in a healthy way. And, and, And what happens is that when there's disconnection within yourself, You think, why am I feeling the way I'm feeling? And you think, oh, it's a spiritual thing. 
or it's a physical thing. It can be a little bit of any of those. We have to understand some of the components about it. And the one I want us to think about a little bit is the emotional side of who we are as human beings. A guy called Pete Scazzaro has written a lot about emotionally healthy leadership and emotionally healthy spirituality. And he said this, we have many people who are passionate for God and His work, yet who remain disconnected from their emotions or those around them. So they love God and they're passionate about God, the spiritual thing, but actually they're disconnected from the emotional part of who they are. The combination is deadly both for the church and for the leader's personal life. That's why you end up often with, with leaders who do amazing things spiritually and yet there's all kinds of train wrecks that go on in their life because they're not in touch with another component, whether it's the physical, the mental, relational, or in this case, the emotional. And one of, the, one of the guys in the Bible, I think, that, that illustrates this is the guy called Elijah uh, from the Old Testament. And Elijah was a prophet, and uh, he goes into the, uh, the, the, uh, to the most powerful man on the planet, Ahab, and his wife, Jezebel. Ahab was the king. And, and he speaks to him, and he says, God has told me this to tell you. There's going to be no rain in the land. Wow. Speaks to the most powerful man on the planet and says, there's going to be no rain in the land. And then he goes on the run for, for a couple of years and then he ends up on the top of a mountain with a big showdown between Ahab and Jezebel's priests and between God and there's a, there's, there's a whole big supernatural thing and God answers by fire and it's just all incredible. In the next chapter, 1 Kings 19, Jezebel threatens him and he runs away in fear for his life, he leaves his servant on his own because he wants to be on his own, goes to the desert, sits under a tree and says, God, I've had enough, I want to die. What's happened? How has he gone from being this bold guy going into the Ahab, the king's palace, and saying, this is what God says, to be on the top of a mountain calling down fire, to being under a tree wanting to die? I'll tell you what happened. He got disconnected on the inside of himself. You see, he was physically exhausted. He'd been running past the chariot. He'd been going at it. He was physically exhausted, which is why when God met him in that moment of what we would call depression and burnout, the first thing God said was, you need to get some sleep and a good meal. Here's the word of the Lord for some of you. You need to get some sleep and a good meal. That may be all you need. Because actually what's going on is that you've not been looking after yourself physically. But then for Elijah, maybe it was also mentally, because he'd been against the odds. He'd been running. He'd been fighting. He'd been, it, mentally, he was just jiggered. He was like, I've had enough. But he was also emotionally exhausted. And you can tell he was emotionally exhausted, because when God said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm the only one left. I'm the only one left. Actually, there were 7,000 left. But emotionally, you ever felt like that? There's only me that cares about this. There's only me that wants to do it because emotionally we can be exhausted and then spiritually exhausted. The most dangerous time I've experienced spiritually is after the highest times spiritually. When we're on the mountain, the most dangerous time is just after we've been on the mountain. And it's because we don't pay attention to all these different dynamics. Listen, if you are burning the candle at both ends, you are not as bright as you think you are. You're burning the candle physically and mentally and emotionally and spiritually. You are giving out, but you are getting disconnected within yourself. The gift for your soul is self-awareness. I've, I've, I've shown it this way with this picture, the next picture, of, of lights on a dashboard. You know, wh wh what are the lights on your dashboard? When you get that light, you think, oh, I don't know what that light is. Anyone ever had that with a car? And you do what every good person does, Google it. And, and it shows you and you think, what, what, I've got to do something. If I don't pull over, remember last week? Pull over, pop the bonnet, change lanes. If I don't pull over and do something, that light is only going to keep flashing and something bad is going to happen. Self-awareness is the ability to see what's going on inside of you. And, and tell me, the best kind of self-awareness, if you don't know what's going on inside of you and you don't have that self-awareness, ask people who know you what's going on inside of you. My wife is great at that. She says, you need a rest. No, I don't. Yeah, there you go. That's why you need a rest, you grumpy old so-and-so. Because you're actually burning the candle too hard. 
and it's physically, but if you don't watch it physically, it's going to affect you mentally or emotionally or spiritually because we are connected, integrated human beings. Does that make sense? And I want to give you a takeaway this morning. And if you don't hear anything else, take this to the bank because this is absolute gold, okay? Here's the thing. This is a gift for you. This is a gift for you. This is what we, we talk about this a lot on our Leadership Academy, something we run here at the church, We're running it many years. I heard this years ago. All of us have like a tank, like an emotional tank. And the reality is there will be things that drain you and deplete you emotionally, okay? And... and, and you can't help it. You've got to give out. You've got to do some of this stuff. For me, let me give you an example. One of the things that drains me uh, emotionally is if I'm counseling, okay, speaking to people, pastoral care. If I'm doing that too much, I love it. I can do it. Don't. If I'm doing it too much, it's going to deplete me. I look at Sandra, who's our pastoral care. Isn't she absolutely phenomenal? How does Sandra, how does Sandra, like, yeah. How does she sit with so many people and listen to so many people and not scream? How does she do that? Because she's not wired like I am. She's got that gift. She can do that. But she will look at some things that I do and it will freak her out. It will energize me, but it will deplete her. This is not about right or wrong. This is about how we're made. So for me, that depletes me. Too much detail depletes me. If I've been in things where it's very detailed, very this, too much negativity over a long period of time, I'm getting drained. Some of you are feeling that as well, just as I'm talking about it. And if I'm, if I'm only giving out, I'm in trouble. I have got to replenish my emotional tank because I'm going to get depleted. What you've got to do as a human being is know what depletes you and know what fills you. And then give yourself permission to fill. If you don't do that and you let this level go down, this will be like irritation, burnout. You'll get down to depression and all this kind of stuff like Elijah did. Elijah just poured out and poured out and poured out. He didn't allow anything to pour in. That can happen to you and it can happen to me. And so for me, I discovered this many years ago. And, and one of the things that I discovered, there's two things that, um, well, a lot of things that feed me emotionally, but two things that feed me emotionally are movies, going to the movies, and nostalgic music. The music that I used to listen to in my late teens and early 20s, and I make no apologies for it. So I bought a ticket to go see Bon Jovi live in June, and uh, I try and go to movies as much as I can. Some of you don't even know who Bon Jovi are. <laughs> May you be forgiven. Okay, and I'll forgive you. And whatever it is for you, you've got to allow yourself permission so that you keep emotionally healthy. It's part of your soul. Does that make sense? Disconnection within yourself might just mean for some of you, you need to get some good sleep and a good meal. Might mean for some of you, you need to look at your physical life. Might mean for some of you, you need to look mentally. You know, maybe, maybe spiritually, and we'll come on to that in a moment. But disconnection within ourselves is damaging to our soul. Second area, and I need to move, is disconnection with others. You know, and this is really big for your soul. You know, I don't want you to think that the soul is all just about you and God. You know, it's not about that. You see, God has, is really clear. We were created for relationship with God and for relationship with each other. And if you're not a Christian yet this morning and, and you're thinking, what is all this kind of community thing? This is the most important thing, you know, one of the most important things. We're not just created to know God, we're created to be in community and relationship with other people as well. Our souls can never be truly healthy outside of community and relationship. And our, relationship, our relational health is sustained at a soul level by the state of what I call the relational seesaw. If you've ever seen uh, seesaws, okay? And here's the reality. There are people in your world that take you down, aren't there? Don't say I'm sitting next to one of them, all right? Especially if you're married to them. But there are. They just take you down. And it's like this seesaw thing. And we have to learn to navigate that. There are people who drain us relationally. There are people who at times even damage us. But there are people in our world that we have to deal with. And we can't just knock them off the seesaw. We have to find a way of dealing with them. In this book, In Soul Detox, there's a great chapter on this where Craig Rochelle talks about what he calls the toxic trinity. He talks about chronic critics. He talks about manipulators, controllers, and tempters. It's a really, really helpful book. And he talks in there about understanding these people who are in your world, but then how to engage with that because you can't just always kick them out of your life. You've got to deal with it. Maybe they're part of your family or your work situation or whatever. 
And I think there are two ways of dealing with this relational seesaw. First, establish some good boundaries and fences. You know, Jesus modeled this so well. He loved everyone equally, but he didn't treat everyone equally. So he withdrew from the crowd. He invested in a few, not in all of them. So he loved everyone, but he didn't treat everyone exactly the same. At times, he even drew a line and um, 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 drew a fence, made a fence. It's like once he, with Peter, Peter was really pulling him down and he turned to him and said, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, if your nan is winding you up, don't try that line with your nan, okay? What he was saying is that, listen, the kind of, the evil one is in you and, and, and you're weighing me down. I've got to draw, a, I've got to put up a fence here. This is, this is taking me down. So boundaries and fences. But secondly, you've got to balance out the seesaw. If you've got people in your life who are pulling you down, you've got to make sure you've got people in your life who are pulling you up. You've got to balance out that seesaw. One of my favorite stories in recent years has been Mark chapter 2 where it's a story about healing, but I think it's a story about much more than healing. So this guy who's, um, who, who can't walk, he's paralyzed, and, and, um, and one day four of his friends hear that Jesus is in town, and, and so they, they, they go around and they, they put him on a mat, and they, they lift him up like a stretcher, and they carry him to Jesus, and they can't get to Jesus because of the crowds around the house. But they're such amazing friends that they don't take that for an answer. And they go up on the roof and they bash through the roof. And Jesus looks up and he sees them lowering their friend down. And the Bible says, when he saw their faith, he healed him. And there is a story about healing, but it's also a story about friendship. Because great friends carry you when you can't carry yourself. Great friends will crash through barriers in order for you to receive what you need. And ultimately, great friends in our context help get you closer to Jesus. Do you have great friends like that? Do you have great friends who will carry you when you can't carry yourself? Who crash through barriers for you? Who help you get closer to Jesus? If you haven't, we need to get them. And before you feel too, oh, I haven't got them, I haven't got them. Here's another challenge. Maybe you could be one. Maybe you could be one for someone else. We need these kind of friendships, relationships in our life. If you haven't got them, guys, it takes a decision. You are never going to drift into meaningful community. If you don't have those kind of friends, don't sit there waiting for them to come. Make a decision to move towards people. But it also takes vulnerability. And what I love about this story is that it took vulnerability for that man to let them carry him, didn't it? I had a conversation with someone just yesterday. <sighs> And I was so frustrated because it was somebody who I love and in our world and stuff. And, and, and somebody had offered to help them with something and, and they'd rejected that and pushed it away. And I, I found myself getting quite direct with this person who's much older than me and said, hey, would you do that for them if the situation was reversed? And went, oh yeah, of course I would. Well, why won't you let them do that for you? I'll tell you why. It's pride. That's what it is. Vulnerability is, right now, I can't carry myself, I need help. And when we do that, we establish relationship as God intended. And there comes a moment when actually we're in a situation where we can extend that for them or for somebody else. But it takes vulnerability. So don't let your pride stop you from the relationships that God wants to put in your life. In Hebrews, it says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. One of the ways as a church that we try to address this is through our small group system, which have been called in this last period of time, life groups. And as part of Vision 2020, we've been reviewing life groups, we've been on a journey with elders and staff and life group leaders. And so we've come to a point where we want to initiate some changes going forward. And so as of today, we're changing the name from life groups to connect groups. I know we've changed them from care groups to home groups to cell groups to life groups. If you've been to every single one of those groups, you get a medal. Is that okay? Um, but we're changing it to connect groups for the reason that we feel this is language that suits us better for this season uh, in, in, in our journey as a church. Um, we want to say to people, are you connected? You know, connection point, connection lounge, it just helps us. And it's really about kind of, kind of refreshing the whole approach to small groups. 
Bigger changes than this are on their way in terms of the, the, the terms of the groups and how they're shaped up. We want to see it mu being much more dynamic and being full of movement. We, we don't want to see groups going on and on and on forever. We want to see a sense of maybe after 18, 24 months, the group might morph or multiply and, and change a little bit. And we want to work with people on that. We're also going to put more resources into our connect groups as well as uh, content and material that we do centrally. Uh, we've, the biggest resource is people. And so Nev and Elizabeth Shave, who've come in uh, to help us as associate pastors, Nev is heading up connect groups. And these guys are going to really put uh, investment into groups, which is so important. The gift for your soul, folks, is community. If you feel disconnected within yourself, are you in community? You know, research suggests that people, do, people who do life in groups have a better mental health and a longer life expectancy. So our new motto is join a connect group or die, basically. Because the research says that if you're connected relationally, you have a longer life expectancy and a better mental health. So join a group or die. The choice is yours. And what I want to say is if you haven't joined a group, why don't you do that? Go, go talk to Nev and Elizabeth and Sandra and some of the other guys and go to the connection point and say, hey, I'm not in a group. If you used to be in a group, return. If you are in a group technically, but never go, go. Seriously. There's many people who are, oh, I'm in a group, but you never go. And when you go, you don't invest. And when you go, you're not vulnerable. And when you go, you don't give. That's not going, that's showing up. But when you actually go and you say, hey, I want to build something here. Let's build relationships. Let's build community. Let's carry one another's burdens. Let's spur one another on. You know, on Tuesday after we'd had our discussion, we split into guys and girls. Had an awesome time. Just It's a small group at the moment. Just three of us are gathered around a table, speaking into each other's lives and just praying for one another and standing with one another. And I, I, I'd been in London on Tuesday. I got up at half five and so I was in London. I got off the train and literally went straight to life group. I was a little tired, but as I came out at half nine, 10 o'clock at night, my soul felt well. My body was a little bit shattered, but my soul felt well because community is a gift to your soul and we need it. Final area is disconnection with God. Salvation. The salvation of your soul is not just about where you go when you die. The word salvation in the Hebrew language literally means rescue. To the Jews, it meant rescue from external circumstances. So save us from the Egyptians. Save us from the Philistines. Save us from the Romans. Salvation. Messiah will come, they thought. Messiah will come and take away Rome. Salvation, rescue from external circumstances. To many Christians, salvation is rescue from the consequences of sin so that when we die, we go to heaven and be with God. Salvation is much bigger than all of that. Salvation literally is rescue from a life of disconnection with God now and for eternity. Whatever is disconnecting you from the life of God, you need rescue from. Maybe it's worry. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe it's health situation. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's sin, maybe it's doubt. Whatever it is that is disconnecting you from the life of God, we need salvation from. We need rescue on a daily basis. The Psalms say, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. There's this holistic sense that we want to connect with God in the center of who we are. For the soul to be well, it needs to be connected to God. Jesus puts it this way in John chapter 15. So you must remain in life union with me, for I remain in life union with you. For as a branch severed from the vine will not bear fruit, so your life will be fruitless unless you live your life. Listen, intimately joined to mine. Isn't that a great phrase? Live your life intimately joined to mine. What stops me doing that? What disconnects me from that intimate joining between my soul, my, the Spirit of God within me and God's Spirit? And this week I just wrote a whole load of things down that came to me. And, and, and I'll just read it out to you. The water that we're drinking. I don't mean the literal water, but the water we're drinking, the air that we're breathing. You ever been in a situation, oh, what air am I breathing? The food that we're eating, the stuff that we're watching, the words that we're 
hearing, the thoughts that we're entertaining, the lies that we're believing, the hurts that we're carrying, the fears that we're holding, the sins that we're hiding, the vulnerabilities that we're protecting, the way that we're running, the way that we're doing this life thing. Years ago, someone said, and I've never forgotten it, the way, he said this, I realized the way I was doing, let me get it right, the way I was doing the work of God was destroying the work of God in me. The way I was doing the work of God was destroying the work of God in me. Pull over. Pop the bonnet. Change lanes. Fill that emotional tank. Step into community. But here's something else we can do. I love this verse. Psalm 63, again, the passage translation, I'm just loving it at the moment. With passion, I pursue and cling to you because I feel your grip on my life. I keep my soul close to your heart. It's like saying, I want to keep my soul, God, close to your heart. How do we do that? Uh, in, in Soul Keeping, Ortberg talks about um, Brother Lawrence. Some of you have heard of Brother Lawrence and 400 or so years ago, he wrote a book which is reportedly the most read book in Christ, Christendom apart from the Bible. And it's called The Practice of the Presence of God. Where he talks about, it's great to have kind of like those times, you know, maybe in the morning, that time when you, when you have that little time with God. And I talked about that last week and five minutes in the chair and praying and re reading. And, and by the way, um, Soul Detox has got a U version uh, thing on, on it as well. If you, anyone follow U version, do any plans on U version? There's one of these on, so you can do that as well through this series, which is amazing. Um, but what Brother Lawrence talks about is not just doing that fixed time, but being aware of God 24-7. Being aware of God 24-7. When, you when, when you're shopping, when you're washing up or stacking the dishwasher, when you're at work, when you're with the kids, when you're at play, when you're watching the movie or listening to Bon Jovi, whatever it is that you're doing, being aware of God's presence. And in the book, he frames it as a question that I want to leave with you. And this is the question. How many moments of my life today can I fill with conscious awareness and surrender to God's presence? I'll tell you what's really, really interesting. If we were to live like this and do life like this, I just wonder how more connected we might feel to God. To say, hey God, where are you in this? Or just to think of God or just to say, Jesus. Do you know what I mean? Or just to be more consciously aware of His presence. Sooner or later, your world will fall apart. What matters most is the soul you have constructed. I want to invite the band to come back. We're going to do something a little bit different this morning. Um, you're not going to sing straight away. What's going to happen is that Abby and the band are going to sing to you and over you this morning. This is a new song. And this song is, is based on one phrase taken from another old song, which has a story that many of you will know, but some of you need to hear maybe for the first time this morning. And the story is, is of a man called Horatio Spafford, who at the end of the 1900s was an American um, living in Chicago. And um, he lost all he had in the fire of Chicago in 1871. Uh, it, it also, his son had died of scarlet fever, and he invested all his money into property and lost it all. So his world had fallen apart. He'd lost a son to scarlet fever. He'd lost his money and property, business went down the tube, and he lost his house in the Great Fire of London. Him, his wife, and their four daughters decided to emigrate to, to, to the UK. His wife got on board a ship with the four daughters. He had to stay behind to do a little bit more business and tidy up some loose ends. They headed across the Atlantic, and there was a tragedy across the Atlantic. There was a storm, and, when, and the four daughters died at sea. And when the wife got to, to England, she sent a telegram back to Chicago. And the telegram that he received literally said these two words, saved alone. Saved alone. And Horatio Spafford got on a boat and sailed across the Atlantic to be with his wife. And, and the story goes that as he got a, a, across the Atlantic, somewhere around where they thought the storm had happened, he wrote a poem which became a song. And this is what he wrote. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. 
When your life falls apart, what matters the most then is the soul you've constructed with God's help. And I don't know what you're facing right now. I don't know what storm you're going through. I don't know what bit of your world feels like it's falling apart. But when you focus on Him, when you are connected to Him, when you are connected within yourself and with other people, you can declare, as this song does, it is well, it is well with my soul. Let God speak to you as Abby sings this song over you. And then the guys will encourage you to stand and to sing and to respond through this as well. But just sit where you are and just let God speak into your soul a little bit this morning.